Good afternoon. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for being here in the second of our Mondays in March presentations. I appreciate you all coming out to hear Ms. Sadro, and she's going to step up in just a few minutes. Um, I wanted to just uh, go through um, some notes that we took relative to Dr. Jacobs' presentation, some high points, and he can tell us, shake his head, yes or no, you got it, in terms of some of the major take-home points. And again, our, our goal is to try to do this on a weekly basis, just to kind of keep the topics current and on our minds. So when we get to that fourth week and we do our little panel discussion, answering of questions, we'll be able to emphasize the key themes. So Dr. Jacobs, the things that we listed, number one, it's so critical that we all engage as we try to move UTMB forward. It's a pretty challenging 12 to 24 month period that we're in going back to the beginning of this fiscal year. But if we all continue to work together and focus on what's before us, things that we're supposed to accomplish as individuals in our small groups, um, we're going to be successful. With regard to the research strategic plan, the really important next step is to focus our efforts and investment on areas with the greatest potential for advancing here, advancing our research interest, as well as advancing health care. And you talked about some evidence that we're doing well on that front, the increase in NIH funding last year, bucking the national trend for static or diminished funding. Also, your thoughts about Grants Central, the concept that was developed to um, provide a, a place, resources, if you will, that can help, that does help our UTMB researchers compete effectively in this uh, increasingly competitive funding environment. So um, good news on that front, making progress with regard to our research strategic plan. And the plan itself, in terms of additional details, is coming along nicely. Um, clinical growth and increased clinical productivity, a lot of great work by our faculty and staff on this front. We're still focused on that, understanding that the market is changing. It's very important for us to remain very competitive. And so the folks engaged in the clinical enterprise, the faculty engaged in clinical pursuits are thinking about that and all working together across a number of fronts to help us make sure we're providing the highest quality of service to our patients, that we're doing it as effectively and efficiently as we can, and that we're executing on um, with our mission, which is to not only deliver the latest and greatest in care, but help design what comes next. Um, our education program is doing extraordinarily well. Each of the schools doing very well. Uh, a lot of focus on competency-based assessment and curricula uh, that's being discussed all across the country. It's a little bit like population health management. It's hard to define exactly what that really means. But we all know that we need to do a better job of assessing the competencies of our students and making sure what we're teaching is aligned with what those future health professionals need to do as they enter their chosen career. And finally, I thought a, a very important point is that the way forward, not only for the academic enterprise, but for the institution as a whole, is not a distinct straight line, but rather a series of sometimes small incremental steps. We make progress on almost a daily basis, but sometimes it's hard to see because again, we're all focused very close to us with our individual work and the work of our work groups. So while progress can be hard to see on a day-to-day -day basis, the longer term metrics that we're using to assess progress show that it's being made. We're actually being successful in terms of executing our plans and generating the desired outcomes. So those were my notes, Dr. Jacobs. Anything you wanna to add to that summary? Close enough for now? Okay, all right. Well, now it's Ms. Sadro's turn, so we'll see, see what she has to say. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you. So thank you all for being here this afternoon. Appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and listen to another Mondays in March. Hopefully it will be informative to you. Please ask questions as we go along. I may ask you a few questions, so um, please play along as you, as you can. 
What I want to talk about today are four distinct things. I want to talk about, of course, the CFO has to talk about our health uh, position, our financial position. Um, I want to talk about what our future looks like, so moving to a little bit more of a strategic slant than just the numbers. And then I want to talk about the Enterprise Data Warehouse, where we are with that. I'm sure most of you have heard that we are entering into that world, and I want to make sure that we cover that at some um, level, and please ask questions, and Todd and AJAWS will answer all of them for you. And then I want to talk about the committees and um, fairly new processes that we've set up this past year, talk about what they're designed to do. Certainly, if you have any feedback, you're more than welcome to share that feedback in this venue. But want to talk about what they're designed to do and how they're working to date. So our financial position year to date uh, through February. So we just closed the books um, last week. And what you're seeing up here, I know it's rather small, I apologize. This is the presentation that we do for um, SEC. And we've whittled it down, if you will, to a few primary graphs and some other information we thought might be important to give a high level look. So that first graph, if you can see it, is net patient care revenue. And the blue lines are where we are year to date through February. The red lines are budget. And then the green lines are where we were last year. So as you can see, if you look at that blue line versus the red line, we are um, about on budget if you looked at a trend line in terms of net patient care revenue. If you look at tuition and fees, you'll see that we are basically on budget. You'll see a dip there in August. That's really more of an accounting dip than anything else. We've changed some ways that we account for tuition and fees this year. That's why you'll see it a little more flat. Grant and contract revenue, that tends to be a little bit all over the place. As you can imagine, we receive grant and contract revenue at different periods of time, but we are doing well. Other operating revenue, the same thing. We have some variation there. Most of that's related to DISRIP. Salaries and benefits, we are on a good trend line, although we're a little bit over, but we're on a good trend line for salaries and benefits. And non-labor expenses, we're seeing a little bit of an uptick there toward the end of the year. So what's that mean overall? This is, again, the red, yellow, green snapshot. So this particular slide talks about what our adjusted margin is through February, okay? Um, and where we should be in terms of our budget. So as you can see, versus budget, which is this column, finance folks always have slides that have way little numbers, don't we? As you can see, versus budget, we're doing very well overall. Prior year, some, some's better, some's a little bit lower than we would have anticipated. What that means today through February is that based on a $12.7 million budgeted loss, which we had budgeted and anticipated for many years, this is no different than the six-year projection that you've all seen for the past six years, um, we are at about a 12 million, we're projected to be at about a $12.7 million loss. So we're right on target year to date, which is very good news. Um, the reason that we are behind prior year in some areas um, is simply because the target was different. So we did not anticipate to um, have as much net patient care revenue necessarily in a particular year. So we are a little bit different than prior year, but still in very good shape in terms of budget. What you see on the other side are some key performance indicators. This ties in nicely to some things that I'm going to talk about later. Um, these key performance indicators have been around for a long time. They are what we measure performance from uh, a clinical perspective. They will probably change as we move to that new generation of healthcare, and specifically healthcare. Um, today, we look at things like discharges, patient days, surgeries, and so forth, and you'll see that there's a lot of red and yellow there, and there's two primary reasons for that. Many of you have heard about the League City campus and the fact that we 
had to change out contractors at, towards the end of the process. And because we did that, we had projected already to have volumes and net patient care revenue in this fiscal year. We are not realizing those, obviously, because that's not open yet. It does, uh, is planned to be open in June. But a lot of the reason that we're down in the discharges and patient days is related to that campus, as well as some decline in the Angleton-Danbury campus discharges. This is the all-famous margin improvement project. Who deals with margin improvement on a regular basis? Thank you. Thank you for doing it, not thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> As you'll see up here, um, we measure margin improvement not necessarily by each particular project that um, has been projected, but we measure it in terms of actual to budget performance because it's a little bit hard and would be even more tedious, if some of you can imagine that, if we tried to do it on a project-by-project -project basis. So what this is telling us is that within each one of our missions, the healthcare admission, the academic enterprise mission, and the institutional support mission, this is telling us performance to budget year-to-date, okay? And it tells us then where we need to focus in terms of the margin improvement plan. So you'll see things down in institutional support, and while institutional support might be off budget year to date, that's because we changed some things in terms of what we would accrue on a regular basis, okay? We hadn't planned to accrue for some of the physician compensation, some of the at-risk compensation. Now we are doing that, so it wasn't in the budget, so it looks like we're gonna have a variation. The good news is that when all of that comes to fruition next year, provided everybody meets their goals, we won't have a big oops at the beginning of next fiscal year because we will have already planned for it. Any questions? Is it going away, margin improvement? How many would like it to? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. It's probably what keeps us focused. All right, our financial f future. So this probably should say something more like what's going on in the industry, what's happening instead of our financial future. Um, I wanted to look at the moving parts. So as I walk through this, there's a lot of information. Again, please feel free to ask some questions. Um, but it, it'll hopefully bring forth what's going on in the marketplace a little bit more, make it a little bit more real. There are examples in here for what UTMB is doing, and there are examples in here for what other healthcare organizations are doing, and what other academic enterprises are doing as well. So, what's moving out there in the world? First of all, we know that the patient demographics are changing at a fairly rapid pace. We know that we are, um, going to get differences in terms of how we are paid for healthcare today, it will change. And then there's all those evolving business models. So three, three topics to talk about here. Patient demographics. So what this slide says is that baby boomers are getting older, no surprise. That means a couple of things if everything stays equal. That means that about 13% of our patient population, what we have today, is going to move into Medicare reimbursement. Does Medicare pay more than commercial? Not generally. If they do, you have some real bad contracts. <laughs> and then in the next 20-ish years, 20 plus years, another 26% is going to move into that bucket. A lot of people, right? And there are the numbers down there. So from 45 to 64 years old, here's the 26%, and here's the 13% for uh, 65 years and older. Big, big demographic to pay attention to. In addition to that, the workforce has changed, okay? By 2018, about 24% of the workforce is gonna be 55 years or older. So we're not all retiring at 55 years old, or I wouldn't be standing here. 
In the last 10 years, the workforce has grown about 12.8 million workers. More people are having to go to work. In the age group of 16 to 24, they represent today about 14.8% of the workforce. That's going to decline to 12.7. And workers that are 25 to 54 have increased by 2.4%, but their percentage of the workforce, so there's more of them out there, but their percentage is 3.8%. And workers that are over 55 and over have grown by 46.7%. So what's that mean for UTMB? So overall, that means more people are employed. So if you think about people being employed and how we get paid for their health care, and I'm speaking just in health care, not academic enterprise or research at the moment, but if you think about that, that should be a good thing, right? Because when you're employed, generally you have commercial insurance and you don't have Medicare, so on and so forth for most folks. So it means that more individuals up to the age of 24 are going to stay on their parents' insurance. They've not historically been a group that consumes a lot of health care. That's good. It means individuals in that 25 to 54 bucket um, are generally considered lower consumers of health care, except for the moms and babies, obviously. The big impact here is that while they may have insurance, it may be under the Accountable Care Act, which means that while they have insurance, their uh, deductibles and co-pays may increase a great deal. That has an impact on us because then we're required to go out and collect that, where in the past maybe we weren't. And then workers in the 55 and above bucket obviously present two challenges. They begin to consume more health care, and that need doesn't work like it used to work. And um, they also will be impacted by patient responsibility levels. And as they move into Medicare, they're going to require um, a, a lot less, uh, I'm sorry, the providers are going to get a lot less for the services that they provide. So today, how do we get paid for delivering health care? Today it's on fee for service, so every time I go see a doctor, he bills my insurance company, UTMB. Um, today, what the, what the patient population for us looks like in terms of payer is this. So we have our largest bucket of patients in Medicaid, about 35%. We have the smallest in employees. Commercial insurance today makes up about 11% of our patients. But where's our money come from? So, sorry for talking about money, but where's our money come from? Um, commercial insurance is about 23% of that and it's split between Medicare and Medicaid. So we have fewer commercial payers, patients, but we get paid more for those patients than the other uh, payer classes. Tomorrow we will get paid if you believe everything you read in the paper, and it probably has a lot to do on the presidential campaign, but today if you believe, we're gonna get paid for managing populations and providing value. Medicare tells us that by the year 2018, 50% of the payments they make will be in what they call alternative payment models. So it won't be just if you go to your doctor and have your hip checked, uh, the doctor bills the Medicare for that. It won't be just that, it'll be in different models. So what are some of those models? You've heard these. Patient-centered medical homes, we do a pretty good job with that today. Bundled payments accountable care organizations, being paid for performance. Will we take full or partial risk? Meaning, will we align with a payer? And if we don't meet certain outcomes, we don't get paid. Or if we meet outcomes to a certain threshold, we might get a partial payment. And then shared savings. So those are the models today. I'm gonna to walk you, or coming, I'm gonna walk you through a couple of those and why they're important. Oh, and this last comment, where Medicare goes, so go all payers. So as Medicare says, by 2018, we're going to have alternative payment models. The payers are going to go there, the Uniteds, the Blue Cross, the Aetnas, they're also going to move in that direction. So this population health management I talked about a minute ago, you heard Dr. Callender say that everybody's trying to define what that really means. 
So if you ask 100 people, you'll get 100 different answers probably today. For UTMB, it's, this is our definition. So this does not talk about just the financial component. What it talks about is providing quality of care. So the theory being that while Medicare wants to bend their cost curve, the theory being that if we continue to provide the quality care we have provided today and in the future, and we focus there, the cost should take care of itself, right? So why is the CFO then sitting up here and talking to you about population health? Well, I'm doing that because we just talked about Medicare being unsustainable um, in terms of the amount of dollars they're paying out. If you have read anything about Medicare doing, they call them next-gen payment models. They're piloting them now. Um, some of them are already up in the Houston area, so there was a group of healthcare entities that were uh, selected. They may or may not have volunteered, but they were selected to do a bundled payment around orthopedics. Um, and they are now getting paid one single payment for an entire scope of treatment. That's why I'm talking about it. So they're going to pay us differently, and then they're going to focus on the population health. So we're going to look now at patient outcomes and patient value rather than just a per-click basis. As I said, alluded, alluded to a little while ago, uh, population health should not be defined or directed by finance. That should be done by the providers. Financial folks and business folks are here to provide information, to talk about how we analyze that. But the focus from population health is going to come from the provider groups. So evolving business models, as I mentioned a moment ago, Medicare cannot sustain the cost that they are at. Everybody's known that, heard that, and they're looking for improved and sustainable outcomes. So they don't want just a person to go in and have a heart cath. They want to understand and have people treat the entire patient, what caused them to get to that position, and how do we keep them healthy rather than in the hospital. So we are going to have to evolve. These are some real life examples about evolving business models. I don't know how many of you have heard about Texas Health Resources and UT Southwestern. Anybody heard about that? Um, anybody heard of a clinically integrated network? What that means? Anybody know that Aetna is trying to buy Humana? And that urgent care and freestanding emergency rooms are becoming uh, more and more frequent, you only have to drive up 45 to see that, don't you? And that Memorial Hermann has an ACO already, a very nationally, frankly, a nationally recognized ACO. They've done a tremendous amount of work around that process. So let's talk about Texas Health Resources and UT Southwestern and what this arrangement is. Now, it's still under um, wraps. It is still being um, developed, but the premise of that uh, arrangement right now is an affiliation and a network. They're going to call it Southwestern Health Resources. I thought that was kind of clever, Southwestern and Resources. It's a hospital network. It's going to have two of the UT Southwestern hospitals and Texas Health Resources Presbyterian in Dallas. The other 24 THR hospitals are not in the network at this point. And the physician network will be made up of UT Southwestern faculty physicians, the THR physician group, and some affiliated independent physicians. The academic affiliation will have a population health research center and several educational programs. So why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it so that they can take what's good about each one of them and put them together and they'll look at physician specialties, they'll look at locations, all the things that make up patient care, and they're trying to put all those pieces together so that they can build something to address the population within Dallas in a more effective and efficient manner. Has anybody seen anything? Have you read anything about this affiliation? Rex, do you? Yeah. Clinically Integrated Networks, what's that model and why 
is it important? Well, a clinically integrated network, and some of these have some similarities between them, are physicians that are integrated into clinically integrated networks. So they provide uh, services in a similar manner. It helps them improve the quality, it, it helps them improve um, costs of care, and it gives them the opportunity within their population of patients to manage that population as a group of physicians. There are some requirements, there's always governmental requirements about any physician type relationship that have to be met. Aetna, by a bidding on Humana. This is a pretty big, and I'm sorry I didn't look at the Wall Street Journal today to see where the negotiations are, so this is probably about a week old. But what's the model and why? Well, what they say, meaning Aetna and Humana, they say by coming together that that will strengthen the transformation of healthcare delivery services. They say that Aetna gets 14 million more members, of which 3.4 are Medicare Advantage. So if you look at a high, remember back to the slide about high users of health care, it's very important that they get Medicare Advantage so that they can begin to manage that care, manage the cost. And I'll tell you, when you talk about those two companies, it's all about cost. Okay. Um, in Florida and Kentucky, the insurance regulators have given them uh, the okay to move forward. As you can imagine, that's a heavily regulated decision. They can't just come together because they take um, competition out of the marketplace when they do. It will, um, it will provide them with a combined group of patients so that they can use the data from that combined group of patients to look at how healthcare is delivered and look at the outcomes. Um, the engine inside an insurance company is frankly pretty amazing in terms of the data that they have and what they can do with that data from a predictive standpoint. So what's healthcare say about this? What do the providers say about this? They say it will limit competition. Again, why it's so regulated. It, we think, it will limit their willingness to be innovative. So if they control the whole population of patients, they have less need to come and negotiate with us about how we provide care to their patients, what they consider their patients. It gives them a lot of power over patient health care issues. So if you call and you do need that knee replacement, they can have some power over where you get it and what they're going to pay for it. And in theory, that could increase the prices that are paid by the patients. Not to mention the administrative burden it puts on the physicians. Any thoughts about that? Is bigger better here? Yes? No? I don't think so, but they didn't ask me yet. So urgent care and freestanding emergency rooms. Again, when you drive up I-45, they're popping up everywhere. My husband and I went up to Lubbock this past weekend, and there's a lot of them on the way up there, too. A lot more windmills than emergency care, though. So for one thing, patient care inside the hospital, the reason that these are coming about, in theory, is more expensive than it is in an ED. Um, patients wait until they're sicker, until they come into the ED, so it's a little bit um, more expensive, more complex care. They're more accessible, so it's easier to drive to a window front sometimes than it is to come onto the UTMB campus or, heaven forbid, the Texas Medical Center campus. It can supplant hospital-based ER care, theoretically, with quicker turnarounds. And then think also in these models about the evol evolving population. Um, I use my nephews who are in their early 30s as examples. They're not going to, A, they don't want to make an appointment. That's not how their life is. It's instantaneous, right? They don't want to make an appointment and they want to be seen quick. They want their diagnosis and they want to get out of there and get back to their life. So if they can get into an urgent care center, they're going to do it really quick. They probably prefer to do it on their phone and just have the doc look down their throat and see if it's really sore. So that's a model. 
Memorial Hermann and their accountable care organization. What's that model? What does that look like? Um, the definition of an accountable care organization is up there. I won't read it to you, but basically it's meant to take what a provider earns and put it together with quality metrics and cost metrics and make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze, I guess, is a good way to put that, um, just in kind of rough, raw terms. They're one of the alternative payment models. In fact, it's a very strong alter alternative payment models. Remember I said by 2018, Medicare is going to make their payment models, 50% uh, of their payment models, alternative payment models. This is one of them. So what happens there? So providers coordinate care. They administer the care in the right place at the right time. And um, they can earn savings based on the CMS guidelines for accountable care organizations. So where's UTMB in this picture? What are some of our evolving business models? Um, we've got some pretty good stuff going on. Uh, RHP, DISRIP, obviously that's one. I'll talk about each one of these in a moment. Um, Angleton, Dan Danbury, and League City are definitely population health, new reimbursement um, places, places where we can uh, experiment with that. Our affiliation, well, not affiliation, sorry. Our arrangement, I'll say, with MD Anderson certainly brings in the population health aspects. Correctional managed care is probably one of the better population health um, examples that we could provide. It's a very defined population. Um, they have some challenges in terms of their medical care, and we are reimbursed for our costs, but it's a great population to experiment. I don't mean that in a bad way. Please don't take it that way. Um, to look at how we deliver care, okay? How can we be consistent among our protocols and so forth? And then we have some arrangements with school systems as well. We'll talk about those. So MD Anderson Cancer Center at League City. How many would have known these things if I had not put it up on the screen? Oh, you guys are good. You're on the ball. So the agreement is that we'll lease land to MD Anderson. We'll build an outpatient cancer center on the League City campus. So Donna, tell me if I get any of this wrong. Um, it aligns UTMB and MD Anderson with privileges at the League City campus hospital. So they can be at the League City campus hospital and we can be in their outpatient center. So there's cross benefit. UTMB uh, is going to lease clinical space in their outpatient center. So we'll have a physician provider presence in their outpatient center. And MD Anderson is going to do some of their surgery and admit patients into our League City campus. And we will work with those physicians to share protocols. So as we begin to do that, think about the physician sharing protocols. There'll be a similar, if I, don't, if I take this too far, the physicians will correct me, I'm sure, but there'll be a similar way of treating patients with similar diseases. Rex, I get that right? So if we do that, we get more effective and efficient with the care, hopefully from, frankly, the position of finance folks, hopefully that makes costs more consistent. Okay, predictability in finances. That's not why we're doing it, but that should be an outcome. DISRIP. Um, so to me, this is also another great example of evolving uh, business models. It allows for access to a broader scope of patients that need specific um, care. It looks at our institutional capability to provide population health management. So we have a project, we're, we're involving patients within that project and we can use that data to determine outcomes of those patients and provide care um, in a better manner in the future. It does support the efforts that improve quality of care. It looks at our transparency and accountability. It demonstrates that to, to the funding organisms, which are primarily the government and it advances the triple aim. Managing school system care. This is, um, this is pretty cool, actually, if you think about it. 
These are more um, individual type of arrangements that we might have rather than being under the umbrella of a governmental type um, reimbursement model. So we have direct contracts with school districts and in exchange for that contract, we agree to give them effective and timely care. We have appointments that are available to their employees. Doesn't matter if they have insurance, although if they work for the a school system, generally they will. The prices are pre-negotiated and it encourages folks to seek care before they get acutely ill. So much like you might hear a visit to your primary care doc is in order before you get really sick, same type of thing. The physicians, the providers in the school system contract are there to provide uh, care in a preemptive way. The students, we're looking at a telemedicine program for the students so that we can um, target kids that are in the elementary, the elementary schools. Questions about that? Pretty unique concept, huh? Angleton and League City. Angleton, one of the benefits in terms of population health that we get from the Angleton campus is the ability to take a patient population in a more rural community. We now have them on our EMR, so we can begin to track the health care um, practices of those individuals. That allows us to predict what we might see in communities and place care where it might be most needed. The expansion at League City is pretty obvious. That takes us out into a population of folks for inpatient and outpatient care. It allows us to take that group of patients as well, monitor their disease states, and um, use that information again in predictive analytics and how we provide care. It also puts our primary care physicians and our special specialists where the patients are. So we're taking our provision of care to the patients rather than the patients having to come to us. Correctional managed care, talked about that a little bit. Um, contract with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice in 1994 health care for offenders in more than a hundred correctional facilities. Saw some of those on our drive up to Lubbock this weekend. Offers a wide variety of services, so medical, dental, and health services, 126,000 patients. That's a pretty good network, as I mentioned earlier, a group of patients. And it's 80% of the state's offender population. It is among the world's leaders in telemedicine and electronic uh, medical records. Anybody here work for TDCJ or CMC? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, had an opportunity while I was touring that facility a couple months ago to witness telemedicine. So a provider sitting in front of um, Skype basically talking to uh, a patient and basically being able to evaluate the patient from a telemedicine perspective and not having to actually be present in the facility. It was pretty amazing. Um, the patient was clearly uh, appreciated having one-on-one -on -one time with the provider in that manner and probably got them closer to care in a more timely manner than they might have been um, otherwise. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we are reimbursed on a cost per service basis for them today. So a per click basis today. So putting it all together, so if our patients are moving into the Medicare program, if Medicare wants to bend the cost curve, if we're going from per visit to population health, and if our patient lives attributable uh, means that we, attributable to UTMB means that we can better care for their management and track, uh, tracking of their disease states, who knows what it means to be an attributable life? Becky? What's an attributable life? It is a patient who has received a certain amount of services from UTMB providers and their care is attributed to UT. 
TMB. And so right now we're focusing on attribution for primary care lives, understanding that ultimately the more primary care lives we have attributed to a UTMB primary care physician, that as we move forward potentially, our reimbursement is then attached to those attributable lives. So in this context, the more, attributable, uh, the more attributed lives we have for primary care, the larger the amount of money would be to pay for all of the health care fees that would go with that individual patient. Sorry about that. I didn't tell I was going to do that. Thank you. So some other pulling it all together items. So providers are going to have to work together. They work together today, but they may be a little more closely aligned to treat the patient, not just the sore throat or the, the problem that they have at that moment. Um, they're going to have to treat groups of populations, so diabetes, high blood pressure, so on and so forth. All payers are going to move to this aggregate method of payment. Um, remember we talked about as Medicare does, so goes all the payers. That will, that will happen fairly quickly once Medicare establishes what it really wants in an alternative payment model, Cheryl's prediction. And patients are going to be looking for care that fits their lifestyle, not vice versa. Okay. So they're going to be looking for the cable guy to actually tell them when they'll show up, not to make an appointment that says, I'll be there within four hours. So, and a little example about putting it on, all together. So this is an example of a patient who may have two different issues with their health care. They may be a diabetic and they may have high blood pressure. In the future, we're going to be paid, maybe paid, based on a single payment for that particular individual. If they need a knee replacement, we may get paid for a span of care, a bundle payment that may go from 30 days before the surgery to 90 days after the surgery, depending on how it's designed. From a population perspective, we're going to look at, this particular one looks at Galveston County and um, the attributed patients. So for diabetic patients and hypertension patients, um, we may be paid to reduce those rates throughout Galveston County. So we may be contracted um, to say that we'll reduce diabetic rates by 2% in Galveston County in one year. Any questions on evolving business models? Pretty dense stuff. Yeah. Sorry about that. Electronic data warehouse, what is it? Wikipedia, I love Wikipedia. Wikipedia defines it as a system used for reporting and data analysis. So there are central repositories that have integrated data. They, stir, they store, and they stir too, they store current and historical data. Data can be used for analytics and predictive analytics, not just static analytics. And it can be uploaded and is uploaded from many different operational systems. Why is that important for us? So all that stuff we just talked about, about understanding a patient's disease state, understanding all of the things that are wrong for a patient, understanding how we're going to get paid in the future. The electronic data warehouse is a vehicle that we can use to look at data from multiple sources. So we will be able to analyze populations based on many different things, their geography, their disease state, their age, etc. And we'll be able to use that data to make decisions about how we treat that patient or a certain set of patients that have the same characteristics. It will be the one source of truth. So today we have a lot of different systems and those systems will feed in to the electronic data warehouse making it one source of truth rather than aggregating data from many different sources that may have many different definitions about the data elements. This is directly from the site of one of the um, EDW vendors that is pretty popular today. So I didn't ask their permission, but I put it on my slide anyway, full disclosure. What this says is that in the center, you'll see things like asthma, surgery, hospital operations, those different types of things, if you will, that we want to analyze. And the data comes in from many different places. So on the top left, that says 
financial sources. So that would be things like EPSI, and PeopleSoft, Lawson, so on and so forth. That second cylinder, or disk, whatever we call that, um, are in administrative sources. So that may be time tracking. The EMR source, we all know that, that's our EPIC system. So all things EPIC will flow into the data warehouse. Departmental sources, so what comes out of surgery, what comes out of pediatrics, so on and so forth, will go into the data warehouse. Patient satisfaction scores will go into the data warehouse. And things that are human resource related will go into the data warehouse. And what happens is literally all of this data goes in, it becomes mapped so that it can produce a result that gives you the answer to a question you may ask. That sounds really simplistic, but really that's what happens. It becomes valuable because all of the data going in has been aggregated in a way that the definitions are the same, the sources are clean, and there's no pulling and having to hope that you got the right data in order to produce a result. This is just an example and what this says is this is just simple bubble graph. It allows an organization to understand where their charges are by department. So there's all kinds of things at the bottom that you probably cannot see. We can look at charges, we can look at length of stay, we can look at revenue, total costs, so on and so forth. Just many, many different ways we'll be able to slice and dice. This is uh, probably more interesting to the clinicians and it will tell, um, it's just an example of how we might look at antibiotic use. So basically, in earlier days, we did not administer the antibiotic um, in an early time frame. That has changed and we are administering the antibiotic now very um, soon in the patient's care. And then the presentation, actually this is where the presentation is. So it used to take us a long time before we issued the patient the antibiotic and now we're down to a much less period of time. This is um, an older version of what the next steps are in our uh, implementation of electronic data warehouse. Basically, we've, we were down to two vendors and we are negotiating with those vendors at this point and we'll have a result within, I would say, the next two weeks to begin implementation within the next month. It will take us about six months to really get, three to six months, to really get everything designed, put in the data warehouse, um, and then using the output from the data warehouse to make some decisions that we want to begin to make. Questions? Okay, the committees. How many know about the committees? Raise your hand, Deb. Deb loves my committees, our committees. Okay, so how they work. So there's three committees right now set up, and they were designed so that we could begin to act like a, an organization in certain um, themes and certain ideas that we needed to conduct um, our business. So business development, capital, and real estate are the three committees. So let's just talk about it a little bit just to refresh everybody's memory. Here's the charter for the business development committee. I want to say that something really clear to everybody. The word approval is used in these slides. And what that really means is that the business development committee and the real estate committee and the capital committee will hear certain proposals and approval is the wrong word. Um, there's a recommendation that's made from those committees up to the EVP committee. And that's where the final decision is made about whether we're gonna spend capital or we're gonna do some sort of business initiative or we're going to put people in certain real estate. Those committees are there to hear the detail, look at the pro formas and so forth before it's advanced to the EVPs for approval. So the Business Development Committee looks at targeted initiatives. Um, we give guidance and direction. We look at pro formas. Um, we look at implementation strategies, so on and so forth. There are some guiding principles. Any information presented to that committee is strictly confidential. It's meant, again, to maintain a coordinated effort between 
the health system, the academic enterprise, and uh, institutional support, faculty group practice as well. Those in, uh, recommendations, again, are made based on data. So a business plan that should include financial analysis, market evaluations, and so forth. So I won't read that slide to you, but those are the basic constructs. And this is the process. I'm not sure you can see that. Basically what the process is, is that someone from the health system, academic enterprise, or institutional support comes up with an idea or a request that they want to go through one of these three committees. Their EVP approves presentation to the Business Development Committee. That's the agenda item for discussion. Then there's a determination of whether or not a business plan is actually needed. Then the Business Development Committee reviews the initiative. It approves, i.e. it recommends, or it doesn't. If it recommends, it goes to the presidents and the EVPs for the actual approval to enter into that particular initiative. The capital committee, fairly similar construct. Um, it is to prioritize capital commitments. So I'll, make, I'll give you an example. We asked the health system, the academic enterprise, to go and look very recently at all of the capital desires, wishes that they had, and come back and prioritize those. Those were presented to the committee, and then we developed a capital construct that um, looks at the amount of funding that we have and where the funding will come from and created a prioritization list based on that input. It does recommend an institutional capital plan, an annual capital budget, and looks at the funding for that capital. So it just adds a little discipline around the capital process. There's the charter again. It will, we do have relevant policies and procedures. Um, one of the really nice things about this is that there's an integration between the capital committee, the business development committee, and the real estate committee. So in the past, if we were going to put a physician in a certain space, um, it may not have been unintentionally communicated to folks in Mike Schreiner's area so they wouldn't have known to go in and do renovations to a space or, or so forth until it got to uh, a time crunch. Happens back and forth both ways, but the purpose again was to make sure that we were all communicating. There's the capital planning process. Again, on the left side, health, health system, academic enterprise, institutional support, um, submit ideas. They're coordinated between the business development and the real estate committee and this particular section right here is what we're talking about. So those are new innovative business plans and they're promoted for uh, institutional consideration. They go to the capital committee and then it follows a very similar process. The capital committee either needs additional information or financial information. If it does not and it's happy with all the information it has, then it will recommend it to the EVPs for approval. The real estate and space, um, this is meant to guide real estate in a more strategic format. So if we have a lot of space coming vacant, that space goes into an inventory, if you will, with the real estate committee. And then rather than having folks fill up space, which we pay electricity on and we, you know, we heat, we cool, we have cleaning and so forth, the real estate committee understands what's in that inventory and then can make strategic suggestions about what should go into that space. A little bit more about that again. It's a coordinated effort between capital and business development. The hope there, as I mentioned earlier, is that we might reutilize or decommission. So we did decommission a few buildings uh, a little while back and we're not paying again the heating and cooling at the levels that we would. So it's meant to use our resources a little bit more judiciously. And there's the construct for the real estate committee. Questions? We have uh, five minutes. Yes, questions? We have a microphone? Yes. Did you say what the triple aim was? Sure. Rex? 
Deb, explain the triple aim. Um, it's basically um, better patient engagement, satisfaction, lower cost, better quality. Mark? Uh, exactly that. It's <laughs> he was sitting better there process, like this. better outcome at an affordable cost. Yes. Thank you. He's my straight man. <laughs> Anything else? Bless you. Nothing like sneezing right in front of everybody, isn't it? Anything else? I have a question. Yes, where are you? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we received a few questions um, through the EAC and uh, Weekly Relay Sun. Um, if we have time for one of them, I can Please. do it. Okay. Um, one of the questions was, uh, what is IS doing to stop the spam from getting through the UTMB firewall? It is a weekly occurrence these days, and it seems to be getting worse. <laughs> Todd? I wish Cheryl would have talked a little longer. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, actually, it's a good question. So you may have noticed there were announcements about this, but as part of our margin improvement, we actually switched the software we use to filter spam. And so we went from a product that used to be called Proofpoint. You might have seen that in your digest. We went to a product that's uh, Microsoft's product called Exchange Online Protection. Basically, we went to that product because it's really no cost to us. It's included in what we get from Microsoft. The problem is when you start to implement one of those products, we, we turned it on fairly conservatively. So that means that if we turned it on at a high level of sensitivity or, to, or fidelity, we would block a lot of emails. And we were afraid that we might block things that you really needed to receive. So, um, last week, we just turned it up one more notch of sensitivity, and you'll kind of see us. What, what we're going to do, actually, I was talking to Rex about this um, because he just mentioned to me before this meeting. Did you put this question in? He just mentioned this to me that he was noticing we were getting a lot more spam. So um, essentially what we're going to try to do is communicate out when we turn up a sensitivity level, just so you know you may want to check your digest because we may be blocking more mail than we traditionally have. So um, you know, fundamentally, it's just that we're going through a little bit of pain as we transition products. The other thing I would say, just since I have the stage, is that we will never, ever, 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 I promise, ever send you an email and say, please log into this site <laughs> to validate or to get more email or to, I mean, trust me, we will not do that. It is not us. Um, however, a small handful of us fall for that every time. Those mailbox get compromised, and we've had really a pretty big ramp up of those in those compromises happening recently. They get compromised, and people use those to try to fool the rest of you into doing the same thing. And so you'll see them, you know, for some, you know, nobody in neurology is sending you an email about the, from the IS help desk. I trust, trust me on that. So that's another contributor is just, you know, things we're doing to ourselves. But uh, again, we'll do a better job with the uh, spam filtering with, uh, with the Microsoft product, and we'll continue to kind of turn up the sensitivity on that and try to, try to block that. And certainly, as you experience those things, feel free to let us know. That always helps us uh, um, do things faster. So thanks again. Thank you. Is there another one? We got about two minutes. Okay, um, I do have another one. Um, what are we doing about competitive encroachment? Dr. I, Callender, do you want to talk about that, or you want me to talk about that? <laughs> I'll talk about it. I'd be the last thing I get to talk about. Um, if you if you think about the business development committee. Um, and you think about the strategic conversations that the health system has and the academic enterprise has, all of those strategies are meant to not only make us better, but to help us um, get rid of some of that competitive threat. As we, one of the reasons that I looked at the business models was to, the evolving business models, was to get us thinking about what is going on out there. So as we begin to think about how we provide care, how we perform research, how we do all of those things that an academic enterprise does so wonderfully, we also have to pay attention to what is going on out there in the Memorial Hermans, in the St. Luke's and so forth that are providing care today in a little bit different way. You saw what UTMB is doing, so those things that we are doing are our way of preparing ourselves for when the clock switches and when the payment models actually turn to what Medicare has said they're going to do. So we put 
we put the provision of care up in the League City campus. We put it up in Angleton Danbury so that we can be there. We can develop attributed lives for patients, with patients, and we're ready to implement models of care that will allow us to be sustainable in the future. There's nothing that says that there aren't partnerships that may go on with other healthcare organizations, that may go on with um, other providers, other insurance companies, all of those things today are part of making yourself competitive in the future. So we look at those consistently. Business development looks at a lot of them. Um, Dr. Jacobs, Donna Sollenberger are constantly looking at ways that they can continue to not only keep but expand the care that we provide. How'd I do? Yeah? All right. To answer the question? Okay. We are after one o'clock. Happy to stay and answer questions if you'd like. Thank you very much for your attention. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.